Can you hear me? No? Okay, let's see what's going on here. I can't hear you. That's good. Ah! Can you hear me now? Oh my gosh, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Very good. Awesome. How's it going? Good. How are you? Good, good. I was so excited when I found your YouTube videos. I was just sitting one day and it was like, you know, just YouTubing like Angora rabbits, Angora yarn, Angora. And it was like, here's these earrings I make. And I'm like, wow, those are awesome. You know, and it was like one of your videos, you know, you were showing your jewelry that you make. And yeah. I so different from, you know, yeah. what I do. So yep. I, I want to talk with you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's funny that you messaged me when you did, because like I told you, I had just found your stuff, I don't know, within the last couple months here, um, and started fangirling. And, huh? um, and I've been listening. I just found your podcast. I didn't even know you did a podcast. So I found that now. So I've been listening to that. And yeah, it's interesting. A lot of the stuff you said, I'm like, yep, been there, done that. So, uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I don't do much of my podcast anymore. I was going to switch to like a different schedule, but after like 200 some episodes and then trying to do YouTube at the same time and everything else. And then with yeah. COVID and virtual school or no school, and it was like not doing it. So. Can't keep up. Yep, I get it. I get it. It's a oh. lot. Um, I didn't even realize you had that many. I haven't gone through the list of your podcasts. I just started at the beginning. So you had a lot. Yes. That's awesome. Yeah, thanks. So, so you've <laughs> diversified everything then. I mean, you've hit pretty much every point that you can hit on social media. In, in some aspects, yes. And some are more, some I go into more depth with than others. And so, yeah. you know, it's like, I have the ones that I really concentrate hard on and the other ones that are kind of, they're there and they're really just utilized to funnel to where I want um, viewers to go to where my main yep. stuff is. So, okay. Okay. Yeah. So oh, awesome. 15 years, was it 15 years ago that you started with Angora Rabbits? Is that what I heard in one I of your did. videos? I did. It's been, um, it was 2005. Um, I started spinning before that, um, took a drop spindle class, fell in love. And we, kind of the same story as you, I think, we had one acre and I thought, well, I need to find a fiber animal that I can do because sheep. You know, in my brain, all it was was sheep. That was it. And um, went to my first fiber festival and had never seen an Angora rabbit and saw them for the first time. And I fell in love. And that was my mission was to get, um, get one. So that's how I got started. Yeah. And it have been con constant ever since. Did you find so. um, it was like once you saw them and like, once you saw the rabbit, it was like, okay, like this whole world kind of opens up and it's, yeah. it's like this whole yep. little fiber universe. Had no idea, had no idea. And even today you tell people that you spin Angora rabbit and the faces and like people can't process that. And then they go right. to the whole, um, well, how do you kill the rabbits yeah. to do this? And I'm like, no, You're so, right. yeah, it's an interesting conversation to have with people. Right. So. Do you find you do a lot of, um, explaining or educating when you start talking to people about what you do? Oh, absolutely. Because, and, and granted the last couple years, um, spinning has become a thing again. 
um, it's gotten a big audience and I think people are more aware. But when I started doing it 15 years ago, it was weird. It was still weird. Um, even just the spinning part, let alone spinning rabbit fur. And so, yeah, I've had, and even today, like, it's so funny, 2020, I've had a couple years here where this is going to be my year. So we have five kids um, and I homeschooled them. So when I started 15 years ago, it was a hobby and became a side gig for me. Um, and I never could go full both feet in because, you know, I was focused on the kids. And so when um, the youngest one was a senior a couple years ago, I had my website built um, and got everything started. And then we got a call. We were, we've been foster parents over the years. And so we got a call to take back two of our foster kids, like two months after I had all my plans arranged. And of course we said yes. And so I put everything on hold again at the last couple of years and 2020 was going to be my year. And I started out the day before Michigan shut down. Oh. I had my um, library. I did a kid's library um, gathering thing. I took a bunny. I took my spinning wheel. Um, I I wrote a children. I have a children's book that I wrote about spinning and knitting. Um, and so I that was kind of the thing. I took it to the library and I had a library program. And I I loved that because it was teaching kids and um, the whole realm of it. And the day after Michigan shut down. So I had all these plans. I was going to start doing library programs and doing shows this year and I haven't done anything. So yeah. I'm, I'm just sort of stalled again. So it was interesting. You messaged me when you did because, and I think you mentioned this last Saturday in your um, live spin, you said you get to the point where you're like, I'm done. Yeah. I just want to be done. <laughs> And, and that's where I was like the week before you messaged me. I'm like, I'm just done this year. I'm not, I'm going to get rid of everything. I'm not doing it anymore. And then you messaged me. I'm like, okay, I can do this. <laughs> it's, it's interesting. Yeah. Your children's book. It is, yes. how to, is it how to spin a bunny? Is that? Nope. Mine is Alice has an idea. Can it's on me? Amazon. Okay. I published it. Um, I wrote the book years ago. I mean, probably eight to 10 years ago, I wrote the book. Um, and essentially it's my story. Um, and I wrote it with sheep because at the time no one knew you could, and I've never owned sheep. I own, I've owned the rabbits and I've owned, we've had alpacas, we've had pygore goats. We did the whole farm thing, but I've never had sheep, but I wrote the book with sheep in it because, you know, in people's brains, that's what they go to when they think of yarn and wool and everything else. So um, Alice is my character, who is me, who grew up in the city, dreamed of living in the country, bought her farm, bought sheep, and Alice has an idea is the theme throughout. So what am I going to do with this farm? What am I going to do with these sheep? I'll learn to spin. What am I going to do with all this yarn? I'll learn to knit. And so that's the that's progress awesome. of the book. That's so, awesome. yeah, that cool. was my, uh, and then my daughter um, illustrated it for me. So that's how I was able to do the illustrations and everything. So it's kind of a joint venture with her and I. So, yeah, it that's was fun. fun. Are you yeah. going to do more books, more children's books? I, I have another one. Um, it's already written. It's, and it's a true story. It's called Alpacas in the Backseat. Um, and literally how we brought our two alpacas to our farm. And it, it, it's a true story. So, but it's written in a children's book and it connects to Alice. So it's Alice bringing alpacas to her farm. Um, so it's written. Um, and yeah, my daughter hasn't, she's, she's a mama now so she's got three littles and doesn't have time to illustrate it right now so i'm kind of patiently waiting for maybe someday um i have branched out and reached out to like publishing companies a few times with both books um my original was to you know we my daughter and i wanted to do it together and when you do that publishing companies don't that's not how they work 
They want your book, they'll find an illustrator. And so that's what has caused me to be hesitant to seek out publishing, but I don't know. I don't know what I'm going to do with them. So it seems, yeah, the, with the advent of Amazon and the ability for Amazon direct publishing, it really allows for a lot more control for the author because yep. just something that might seem simple is becomes very much complex if you're trying to work with your editor and you're trying to work with your if you have your own agent and you have your own publishing company and it was like right there's some things that's almost you know overwhelming and the control that you have to be able to say no this is how i want it and this is when i would like it to be out by and yes. these are the words and the placement of the words and however it is it's it's so much more in your in your control and then it's really it remains just yours and it isn't uh like soured or modified to the extent that it's no longer what you intended it to be so right it doesn't always yeah. happen obviously, but yeah yeah amazon is amazing yeah. for yourself it is it yeah. is yeah i just bought your book recently too oh. so i'm what? going through that now awesome another thing i found when i was researching so yeah cool cool so when i think of the you know the idea that there's when people think of spinning it's sheep we you know we spin sheep and we don't spin rabbit and the idea that you brought up was that there's a lot of education that we do whether we're at events or whether it's a youtube video or simply talking to your friends when you're if you're getting into rabbits or you're telling them this is what i do and it's like um like a forgotten almost like a little forgotten piece of life and when you know when you kind of think about all the different skills that are involved just with keeping rabbits and all the different skills that are involved with spinning and then with making your creations and your ideas how did that happen for you you said the story of alice it was like she kind of had an idea then she had yarn then she you know sheep yarn and moved through it how did it happen for you that you you have all these skills the spinning the animal husbandry the creative you know being able to literally just make your own jewelry yeah um so for me i think it happened um i learned to crochet um my mother-in-law taught me like 30 years ago and that to me the creation side i think that was the first time for me it was brought out in me and i just fell in love with creation creating things and from there it went to things like bread and making my own bread and making my own food i mean it was a huge thing for me um and then once i knew i could crochet and then the old skills started you know there's a lot of old skills that we've lost and so i started researching them and that's when spinning came up and the idea of having um and you've talked about this too before where you can go to walmart and buy yarn but it's not the yarn that you want to have mm -hmm. and that's what it was for me um was just the idea of having my own animal where i am creating my own thing was it it struck a chord in me that just and the minute i sat down at, at a spinning i actually was able to use a spinning wheel the night i took my drop spindle class the the yarn shop owner said you know i've got a spinning wheel in the back do you want to try it and i'm like yes and i literally sat down in front of that thing and i was spinning there was for me there was just there was no learn no it, it there was no hesitancy it was just instantaneous. I loved it. Um, and so it was like I had done it before and, and it was so easy. Um, so that's kind of how it happened. And then of course, researching the rabbits, um, 15 years ago, the internet just wasn't where it is today at all. Um, and I can remember the few articles that I found or few blog, I don't even know if blogs were a thing back then, but the few things that I found, 
you know, people said, you absolutely cannot spin 100% Angora. You can never do it, ever, ever. And I'm like, well, watch me because <laughs> that's my intention right now. I'm going to go do it. And, and that's mainly what I have spun over the years is, you know, I've had my Pygora goats. I've had my alpacas. Um, I, and I still have some fiber saved from them. But Angora is still my first spinning love. I just love sitting down at my wheel and, and feeling the Angora and making it into yarn. So, yeah. It's very different, you know, in, in some ways. You know, I, the spinning 100% Angora, it is, it is a smooth fiber and, and it is, it spins in its own way. And I have this thing where I'm like, I was trying to talk to uh, my husband last night and tell him that like the fiber will tell you what it wants to be. Like it, it talks to you when you're spinning. It's like, okay, this is, I'm, I'm going to spin like this. I like spinning like this. And and he's kind of like, okay, whatever. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> you know, I'm just like, you're kind of loopy, but I like it. And, but you know, it's like the Angora, it does have its, I feel like it has its own way that is different from many sheep's wool. And you know, the sheep's wool is, there's such a variety of sheep's wool. And there is a variety of Angora, such a variety of Angora as well. But when, when you were spinning Angora, you have, you have French Angoras right now. Is that right? And then yep, you have I have French, I have French and English. Um, and I also have one German right now. Um, my intention was to, to head that way for fiber production. Um, we'll see what happens, but yeah, that, that's where I'm kind of sort of heading is towards, um, bulk more than, um, I love the English. They're just adorable and I love their faces, but they're the smaller of those three. So, yes. um, yeah. What do you notice with spinning all three of your different types, your different breeds of rabbits? Do you, what are the differences you notice? Um, so with the English, um, it maps more on the rabbit easier. Um, and it, and I have, I have a few rabbits where I notice um the french are a little bit more coarse and the guard hairs are, are more noticeable to me um on certain rabbits um the german is definitely got the staple length um so those are the, the the major things i notice with them now to over the years i've i have done more um color matching rather than this is an English rabbit and this is a French rabbit. I've blended a lot of French and English over the years. So um, to notice it that way, once it's together, I don't notice it as much. I do a lot of, I, <laughs> I started out with um, satin and English and, you know, and then I really love Germans. And yet it was like, there's always, I always have this search for like the perfect blend of rabbit. When you think about the ease of, I, I am somebody, I want ease of care. I don't want, um, I don't want to be grooming every single day. I don't even want to be grooming every single week, but it's like personality matters and, you know, ease of handling matters. And obviously breeding for that certain, like a certain type of wool, I, I don't want to have something that mats easily yet I want there to be enough wool on the rabbit that it's not like uh, you, you kind of feel like you're, I feel like I'm wasting my feed for only a small bit of fiber. Um, but one thing I've noticed is that there's a lot of other Angora rabbit owners who go down that same path where after owning a few breeds that are perhaps breed, breeds of rabbit that are in their breed standard, they are 100% this or 100% that. There's a lot of other Angora rabbit owners that start looking at them and then creating their own um, cross or their own hybrid, their own blend. And a lot of the time I notice it's like, it's us hand spinners that, you know, we, we find, we kind of take a look and we're like, I would like, I would like a little bit more of this, or I'd like a little bit more of that. And we kind of, we do this ourselves. And yet there's no, um cohesive place for us because you know the arba has their own 
you know, the, the breeds of rabbits and they're not blended together. And then, you know, the eye garb has the, has the Germans and um, the hand spinners, you know, these, these other rabbits that we have that suit our, our needs or our, our dreams or whatever it is that we're working towards, there's no place really for our hybrids. And I don't know if you've ever thought this, but I wish there was. I wish there was a place where there's quite a few of us who are kind of out there sprinkled around and doing the same thing. We're, and we're not organized. <laughs> we're not organized at all. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, yeah, I totally get that. Um, I always tell people I am not a show rabbit person okay. at all. Um, I am strictly a, I love spinning. I love, and, and I'm even horrible at the, um, you know, the genetics. I've, I've done a little bit with genetics and, you know, crossing and, and different things like that, but I've never dove into it because mine is all creative side right. of things. And most, not, well, most people that I know, and actually I'm fortunate, I live in an area where there are four to five other Angora rabbit breeders within a 10 mile radius of me. Wow. But these are all show ladies. They're all show ladies. They show their rabbits. They're serious about the genetics. They're, and they're spinners too. But um, I, I just have never fit into that show side of things. Um, I, I just don't. And so, yeah, I absolutely understand what, what you're saying um, in that regards is that there is a and and that's one thing with spinning that always I don't want to say bothered me but it bothered me was that when you you listen to someone talk about their spinning um I am a I am completely self-taught so I know I don't do things right and even after 15 years there's probably things that someone would go Renee that's not the way you're <laughs> supposed to do it and that bothers me because for me, spinning is such a creative outlet. And when you watch YouTube channels with people who say, you must do it this way, I don't think that's always true with everything. Um, and so, yeah, I think that goes along with the, the rabbits also. Yes, I, I love that you bring that up because that's something that I've noticed as well is there's very much technical spinners where the adhering to whatever particular method that they've chosen or everything is um, planned in advance and executed in a very technical, precise manner. And that's amazing because there's, there's really a level of intelligence and there's really a level of strict control in some ways that I see with that. I find that binding and I find that almost restrictive in a sense where it's like, but then the fiber is not talking to me. It's not, it's not in my hands when it's, I'm sitting there and I'm spinning it and I'm feeling it and it has its own opinions about this is what I'm going to be. Maybe you don't want me to be that, but this is what I'm going to be. And it's like, you know, there's a piece of it where that creative aspect, I feel like it almost dies when, it, when spinning becomes about the adherence strictly to technicalities of, of the actual spinning process. And you know, um, there's a lot, when I first started spinning, I was self-taught as well. It was like looking on YouTube and looking at, you know, looking at things and saying, okay, and reading a book, like, this is how you spin. Okay. And it was always the idea of it was a place to start and it was, okay, here's guidelines, but I can do whatever else works. And that freedom, I think, I tie it back and I, I think back to a lot of the world we live in can be very restrictive, especially during, I think, moving from Wisconsin to Michigan is very different in how everything with COVID was handled. And it definitely feels like, wow, there's, there seems to be a lot more to pay attention to in Michigan. Wisconsin was kind of like, this is what we want you to do and please do it, but you think for yourself too. Okay, and then Michigan is like, okay, uh, this, this, and this are being shut down, and it was like, what? 
<laughs> what? <laughs> you, wait a minute. You know, and, and, but then in besides COVID, it's like life has all these things in it that are really, you know, uh, we have to do them. They make sense to do them. Like we're going to drive on a certain side of the road because that's what makes sense. And we're going to buckle up when we drive because that's what makes sense. Yet spinning is, there's a freedom in it. And it isn't, mm -hmm. as, okay, follow the rules, follow the rules, follow the rules. And there's something about that that is, that's really, I don't know if healing is the right word or freeing, but there's something where it's like internally, if it's we- It's very organic. Yes, yes. Yeah, yep. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, if if that was always my thing, if I wanted, um, I love my bits and bobbles in some of my skeins of yarn, you know? Um, if I wanted the, the machine process yarn, I would go buy it, right. but- and, and granted, yarn has come a really long way. I was in Hobby Lobby the other day, touching yarns, going, "Wow, you know, they they've come a long way." But still, there's nothing like having your own animal with your own fiber coming off from it and you creating it. It's it's yeah, it's it's an awesome thing. There is no comparison. Absolutely. When okay. you know, even like I ordered a couple skeins from Knit Picks, so. I think it's wool of the Andes or something, one of their brands of yarn. And I'm like, oh, this is nice. But I don't, I don't know anything about it. <laughs> you know, Like it has no story to me. It has no meaning to me. And there's nothing, uh, in some ways it's like, it's like this story of the Velveteen Rabbit where the Velveteen Rabbit becomes real. And it's like, that's kind of what spinning yarn is, is like when you know your animal, you know the story, you know where, you know it's personality and you can say okay yep like this is arthur i know this is arthur i can tell because of this is this and then you know you you have that connection and there's a very much like a an authentic and very much a genuine piece of it it's it's a hundred percent real and there's no denying it and there's no confusion about it it's this is in a world of sometimes chaos and franticness and unknown and fear and everything it's like this is real and it's soothing. Yeah. Yes, very, very much. Yeah. So if you were to look back, and I really wanted to ask you this question, and you have more experience behind the spinning wheel than me by any means. If you were to look at your experience, and if you were someone, you know, like beginning spinners or someone beginning with rabbits, and you were to offer them your bits of wisdom, your thoughts, your advice, and when they're just starting out with Angora rabbits and spinning Angora yarn, what would you tell somebody? What do you have? What wisdom do you have to offer? Well, I don't know if it's wisdom, because again, I am, you know, as I think back, or yeah, if I'm telling someone this, it goes back to that whole idea. Don't necessarily listen to what other people say make sure you're researching but make sure you're also doing what what comes from you and what feels right to you um because again if i would have listened to those articles 15 years ago i would have never gotten into anbor rabbits because i couldn't spin them you know that was my whole goal um and yes yeah, so you have to balance that because we're not all the same people. You have to balance what one person might say to what, what you think or what you feel um, and not get caught up in the, um, I mean, it's taken me years to get to the point where I can tell people I'm a fiber artist. You know, that whole, um, well, I'm not good enough and I was never professionally trained and I don't have, you know, no one taught me how to do this. I'm self-taught that you have to get rid of um, right from the get-go because I think anyone who can spin, and I've had, a, I used to teach classes quite often and I've had friends sit down at my wheel and some people really just cannot spin. <laughs> um, it's not in their nature and it always amazes me, but yeah, you know, if, if you can do it, then you have a gift for it, for sure. Um, and if you love it, you have a passion for it and, and that's worth a lot. I always, 
I seek wisdom, seek advice. It's, I think it's part of why I search and read and look for things because um, I don't know why. I think I, maybe I just like learning. I have no idea exactly. I'll figure it out one day. But um, when you think about the conversation, the brief conversation we had and before we met where, and you had mentioned a little bit of it, you were like, 2020 is going to be the year. <laughs> like 2020 is going to be the year and I'm going to, I'm going to do this and life happens. So with your business, you've got a website and you're, I don't want to put you in a box, but like, you're really good at making jewelry. <laughs> like you're really good at making, taking your yarn you. and turning it into creations and that's like I said that's that's so different from what I do yet it's like we're still working with the angora you know angora rabbits angora fiber but when you look forward we have you know just a little bit we've got December left and 2020 is over and you look forward to 2021 what are you hoping for for your business in 2021 um I think right now I'm at a crossroads. Um, again, I've been doing this a long time and I've had times where I was making money off from it and times of where they're paying for their food. Um, and that's always been my thing. If they can pay for their food, you know, I get joy from just creating. So for me, I'm at a crossroads right now. I have, um, first of all, we moved up here about five years ago. So I had a setup and we moved up here and the rabbits are still in our garage, <laughs> which is fine. You know, it works for now, but yeah, my, my goal for 2021 is to, if I'm going to continue to do this, to get a better setup, I have older cages for some of them. Um, I need to make the decision to upgrade cages this year if I'm going to continue. And actually I have some very old rabbits. Um, I have been blessed in that area where over the years, I have lost very few rabbits. Um, I can count on one hand where I've lost them under the age of one, you know, where you can go, hmm, something happened here. Um, I've had nine-year-old rabbits, you know, and when I first got into this, people said, you know, if they're outdoors, you're going to get maybe five to six years. And right now, I have 14 rabbits. Um, one German, the rest are French and English, um, one or the other. And six or seven of them are well over five years old. Um, I have a couple out there that I know are seven to eight years old. So I'm going to hit a point here probably in the next year where I'm going to lose a good chunk of what I have right now. And I have to make that decision. Um, am I going to start breeding again? I haven't bred in a couple years. And so that will be a deciding factor for me um, to start either breeding or purchasing a new breeding pair to get going again with this all. So that's kind of where I'm at for 2021. Um, Those yeah, are and then what's that? Those are some big decisions. That's a lot. Yeah. Cages are... Um, Wow, there's, I mean, just in that small area, there's a lot to consider and a lot to think about and a lot of choices to make. It isn't, um, there's always so much, you know, so yeah. much. Yeah. Yeah. And somebody said something to me the other day because I had mentioned that, you know, I wasn't sure if I was going to continue with the rabbits. Um, and, and, and then I said in the same sentence, but if I don't have the rabbits, I don't know what I would do. You know, my kids are grown. Um, and so my days are spent grooming, spinning, knitting, crocheting. That's what I do. And she just said, Renee, if you love it, why would you get rid of it? And that was kind of like a light bulb moment. Like, oh yeah. You know, <laughs> so that's kind of in the back of my head now. Like what else? is there you love it you have a passion for it continue to grow it um so yeah that's that's kind of where i'm at right at this moment what is um when you think about breeding and you think about breeding your rabbits what is something that you'd be hoping for that you'd be kind of i guess how do you set up your breeding program or how do you focus or how is it like for you for breeding 
so when I used to do it, um, I would, I was always breeding for colors um, because I wanted specific colors. I wanted to bring, there are colors out there that I have never seen in my years of breeding rabbits. You know, there's some beautiful colors. So that was always my focus. But again, I was never overly technical with the genetics and all of that. Um, and so if I, you know, if I were to do it again, I would probably research that more. Um, and the decision of, do I want to start with Germans? If, if I'm going to do this, do I start with Germans at this point to get the wool production that I want? Um, and, and then again, the, the texture and the feel of the fiber is different. So, and the colors are different. So there's all of that to consider. Um, but color always seems to be one of those things. And, and I think that's, that's where my creativity goes is how much color can I get? Um, like the white, the pure whites. Um, I would love, I have two pure white right now. I would love to get more pure white. And how could I go about focusing on breeding for just pure white rabbits? Um, so yeah, that's kind of where I would probably head with that. Do you have, are they red-eyed whites or are they blue-eyed whites? They're both red-eyed whites. Um, and one of them is a, if I remember right, um, a descendant of a blue. I did have one blue-eyed white over the years. Um, very beautiful rabbit and, and still remember him fondly. So yeah. Yes, excellent. So red-eyed whites. Um, so you're, you would possibly, you're thinking possibly of German in the future? Yeah, that's where I'm leaning strictly for the amount that you can get from them. And like you talked about grooming, um, every day is just painful for me to think about. Um, I kind of have mine on a system where they get rotated at least once every um one to two weeks i'm grooming everybody wow. so that i am kind of on that but not always i mean i have times where it's been three weeks and i haven't touched a rabbit because life is happening um and i try to stay I, and i have some rabbits that do okay with that you know the texture of their fiber is such that Though I know those rabbits are not going to mat very bad, or if it is, it's just going to be around their feet. And then I have a couple right now where it's like, mm -hmm. I know that I cannot let them go any longer than a week just because of their, their fibers. So. So tell me where you're involved on social, what pages, if for people who will be watching this video, where can they find you? How can they get a hold of you? All that good stuff. Yeah, so I am everywhere, um, Tailspin Farm. So it's two words, T-A-I-L, Spin Farm. Um, I am on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. I have a website. It's www.tailspinfarm.com. Um, I am most active on Instagram, lean towards Facebook a little bit, um, but Instagram is where I am a lot. So, and they can contact me through any of those. Awesome. I wanted to get that out there before I, if, if we ever end this video and I forget, then I'm going to have to be like, oh, great. <laughs> Go back, put this back in. But what are your projects in the future? Um, besides the uh, possibly breeding, getting some new cages, what are some things that you're hoping for, for actually uh, working with the fiber, working on in the future? So right now I am continuing to work with the jewelry. Um, and I am seeking, right now I'm seeking local shops. We have, I am fortunate to live in an area with um, a lot of art focused people. And even though we live in this teeny tiny little town, um, we have quite a few shops right now around us that are doing, um, selling people's art and mine fits in perfectly with that. And so I am going to be seeking out um, a few more shops is what I'm going to focus on right now. Again, I used to do shows, but COVID ended that. So that hasn't happened at all for me this year. Um, we do have a local store um, 
happening right now with a holiday pop-up shop that they have extended through the middle of December. So all of my stuff is down there right now, which has been really nice. Um, and they've been quite active. And then I have a few stores around here that I'm in. Um, I think I'm going to continue to, to reach that. And then after the first year, I hope to work more on my website. It's there. It has a few things on it. Um, but I need to, to, to be more active on that because I think that's going to be the ticket for at least a little bit longer here in Michigan where we are so, um, we really are limited to what we can do um, right. in regards to fiber festivals or anything like that. So um, right. I had quite, um, I had, I did, I was able to do two shows this year outdoors um, at a local farmer's market and they were actually the best farmer's market type shows I've ever done. Um, and so, and of course in Michigan, you, in the winter, we're not doing outside shows right now. So um, mm -hmm. that limits us right now. So I'm going to focus more on my website and things like that. I think. When you do a farmer's market, um, I've never done a farmer's market before. I've done all like shows and stuff like that. Um, but what do you, what is your advice? So for, for someone who's never done a farmer's market before, um, what advice would you have for trying to make it successful? Um, I think setup is always, in any show you do, the way you have your table, your booth set up, um, make that appealing. Uh, I myself always take a rabbit with me. I've, I've got Philip Johnny Bob the rabbit who comes with me to almost everything I do right now. Um, and so that is a huge draw because people can connect, you know, it's that whole connection thing. So I've got a rabbit sitting next to my spinning wheel and, and he's out in a, I take a big um, fenced in area with me, a fold out fence and he plays in there and I'm sitting there and I'm spinning. Yes. People are attracted to seeing you actually do the work um, and that it's real. Because again, the idea in people's minds right now with the Walmart mentality that we can go buy five dollar hats mm -hmm. and have no connection to that item and you're standing in front of a person with a spinning wheel and a rabbit making yarn I, I think that's the the best thing that you can do um, for any booth or show that you do awesome awesome for shows I totally agree I tried the time I tried a show without spinning like without my spinning wheel with me it was the uh, the draw in is completely different. It's a very it's very different in how people interact and who comes in and what's really going on. And it's like the spinning wheel is, you know, it's its own kind of magical thing, and it really piques people's interest. Yes, um, and and it for some people when you get the older generation coming in. Um, it strikes a chord with them because some of these older people can remember their grandmas or their moms doing this stuff. Um, and it, it, I've had people stand there and talk with me for half an hour, just asking questions. And, and that's, that's an awesome thing. I, I love teaching or educating people, um, with, you know, it's still possible to do this stuff. We, we haven't completely lost it. So yeah. Do you think on your YouTube channel, you might be doing more videos where you focus on that, on the, the teaching and bringing it to Yeah, I have, I have a list for YouTube right now. Um, so absolutely, that would be one of the things I would like to start. Um, the realization that people like sitting down to watch you spin and just talk people love that right now. It's, it's a connection for people. I think where, you know, here, like you said, in Michigan, we're pretty limited to what we can do right now. Um, and so I have to get that through my head that me putting a camera, which I've gotten more comfortable. You do get more comfortable over time with sitting in front of it, talking to yourself, essentially, right. but, um, but just spinning and talking to people, I think, the one thing I need to break out of my comfort zone is the lives where you can have interaction and be talking and answering questions. 
that's something that might become important for my YouTube channel at this point right now, um, where I could connect with people and they're able to ask questions while you're in the process of doing it. Absolutely. That, that's one of the things with the internet connection that's where it's like extremely expensive for satellite internet. It's, it's where you approach to, it's $165 ish a month for where yeah. we are, which is like moving from where we were and into here is it's like, but this is a lower quality and we're paying more, but that's in the country. That's just apparently the way it is. I did not know this, but yeah, um, the lives, it is such a way. Yes. Oh, good. Good luck. My oldest said she's making chocolate chip cookies, but, um, oh. so the lives, the lives though, that's something that, wow. I think, you know, when I look back and I think back from just the three short years on YouTube and the first time I was like, okay, I know YouTube has this live feature. I know people do it. I'm going to try it out. It does take, it does take the skills that you have sitting in front of a camera and it elevates them. And sometimes like, you know, it's YouTube. So it's like wild out there. And so like, you have no idea what's going to happen in your comments. And it's like, all right, you know, let's see where this goes. Let's see what happens. And it's, um, it's very enjoyable though, because it is an interaction and it is like, you know, you really, you take what you do and you share it. And yet in the same time, you're, you're learning yourself, you know, and you're improving yourself, which then improves it just for others, which is really yes. awesome. And it's like, uh, I don't know exactly, I haven't researched this, but there's something that happens with lives that um, it's like, it brings in, I don't know how YouTube pushes out the live videos exactly anymore, but there's something where it, it seems to just, however they push it out, it just brings in people who've, who've never seen your channel before, and which is kind of cool too. So well, it's good to know. I haven't done one yet, so yes. I might be doing that one soon, yeah. Yes. Well, that'll be awesome, absolutely. Um, let's see, what are the thoughts? I'm kind of asking you a ton of questions, Baraj, like totally bombarding you with questions here, but what, what other thoughts do you have? Any questions for oh. you or? You know, when, how did you get started? Because I know you're a lot younger than I am. What was, how did you get started in this, this world? This world, right? So uh, a long time ago, my mom's mom, my grandma taught me, you know, she taught me how to knit and she taught me how to crochet. I forgot for a very long time how to crochet. And I don't even know if I really knew how to do it in the first place anymore. Um, and I forgot how to knit after a course of time not doing it after years and then I had to it was like you know learn again and and then kind of set it down for a while it was like picking it up again in graduate school okay and then setting it down for a while and then um you know so the whole fiber arts piece was something I had dabbled in since being young and also with rabbits I started out with my first rabbit named Bun Bun, which is really not a creative name per rabbit, but it was, I was in third grade. So, you know, it was like, I was apparently not creative in third grade with rabbit names, but um, so kind of started out younger with both the animals, the rabbits, and then both um, the, as well as the yarn, the, the knitting mainly. But spinning did not come along until, um, Really, I, w I was an adult. I had my oldest daughter. I was working as a as a therapist. I have a master's degree in social work that I don't I don't I'm not a therapist anymore. I've, I've put that down for quite a while, but that can be incredibly taxing work. And you know, the needing an outlet and needing something where I could see physical progress because obviously it's difficult to see emotional progress or progress in in thoughts or progress in mind it's possible but it's sometimes it's not completely evident and so really also looking at the yarn at the time you know because I was like okay I'm, I'm gonna knit a scarf or knit something or whatever I don't know what I was thinking but going out and seeing the choices that were there it was so just disappointing 
And the yarn in, in for example, uh, like a, a big box store that, that I went to was, you know, just the touch of it. It was, I expected soft. And even though it said soft on the label, it was not the soft, I wanted real soft. And it was, uh, so I'm kind of biased, it was acrylic. And it was like, but I don't want plastic. I don't I have enough plastic in my life. <laughs> And I, I don't want something, I want wool. And you know, you're, I'm looking at, you look at the labels and it's like the wool content is very low or non-existent. And the prices are beautiful though. I like the prices of the yarns, but yeah. the feel was, was not there. And it was really, it was just disappointing. And it was, a, it was very much, um, it was very much just another thing in life that is in a store that anybody could buy that had no meaning and there was no significance to it. And it was, I, I wanted something that had significance. I wanted something that mattered. I wanted something of quality that it was, um, it wasn't just, you know, made in a factory with, with who knows what they use for dyes and if they truly take care of the pollution that they have from the actual chemical dye process or not, who knows? I don't know. You know, and it was like, I, I didn't want that. And, um, you know, through long story short, through all of these experiences as an adult is when it really came together. And, um, and really, it was just, you know, never looking back. I think I saw like Natalie Redding or something on YouTube. And I was like, she's kind of crazy, but I like her. <laughs> like, I want to do that. Yeah. So. She was one of the first YouTubers I found. And I was fascinated with what she was doing. So, yeah. Yeah, I totally get that. Right. I think that's the other thing with educating people. Um, and that's my biggest struggle with the yarns and, and the products that come from the yarn, from the Angora yarns um, is that where you live makes a huge difference as to how much you can sell your stuff for. Yeah. And, and that's been the most aggravating thing for me is um, I can still remember years ago um, I, I did a Christmas show and had all hand spun, hand dyed, um, some of it was my alpaca and, and pygora, but most of it was my angora. And I was all set up and they put a lady right across from me who had $3 scarves from Red Heart Yarn. Oh, and I kid you not, I sat there all day with people touching my stuff and saying how beautiful it was. And then out of the corner of their eye, they'd catch this, this booth and they would charge over there and they were going through and looking for the $3 scarves. And that's when it, it, it's not easy to get that broken, I think, from people's mindset that these animals are handled, cared for, groomed daily by, by us. And then not only that, but then the fiber is handled and created into this. And then if you're buying a hat, it's been, hand, I mean, hours and hours and hours of work yeah. that people just today don't that is the most frustrating thing i think for me um is the reality of that mindset that is out there right now um, yeah. and people can't seem to jump right it's exactly, yeah it's it's very much um it i think it's like its own modern day like m mind virus in some ways because we have in it's like okay so <laughs> i think about things like that, right and so i'll try not to go too deep into my random way of thinking but it's like we are living in a time when there's so many screens around us obviously you and i are in front of a screen and there's many wonderful things that come from a screen or with the use of it yet there's also so much more complexity that happens and so many more choices that we're faced with in life that are you know, something as small as, okay, my, my cell phone, it vibrated next to me. Do I answer it or not? My, um, okay, this person's saying this, what do I, you know, all these different additional choices that are placed in life. And then when you start looking at how many more advertisements that we have and are bombarded with, even just five years ago, the substantial change in the amount that we have in front of us, 
and that we're almost like mentally attacked. And then I start reading, you know, all these books I've been reading recently, just trying to figure out and learn as much as I can about, about all sorts of things, whether it is the actual advertising, the marketing, the, the uh, stealing of attention. Whoops. See, yes. my cell phone again. <laughs> but it's like, you know, the uh, how one of the books I read was like the attention, attention merchants and really kind of the history of advertising and how it um, kind of, Im how it impacts our entire life. And then mm -hmm. the pervasiveness of really the Walmart model and how it's drive price low, drive price low, drive price low, drive price low. Okay, you know, and then there's this, so much of the other component to it, such as, well, who's really making that? And oh my gosh, that's a dirty yeah. question, right? Because uh, it, it, it feels to the person, if I were to go outside, even if I were to go to, to my husband and he has like an acrylic Vikings, Minnesota Vikings hat on because he uh, likes the wrong football team. And so, <laughs> you know, if I were to say like, who made that hat? Where'd that hat come from, right? It's even if I were to say that gently, like, excuse me, it's still a question that has so much to it because um, we don't know the stories of these items that we purchase for $3 or $5. And we don't know, there's a tag that might say where they came from, but we've been conditioned in such a way that we don't really ask anymore. And we don't seem to care so many times to know. Yet there's such a reversal of that going on, which I love to see when people are just like, no, I don't, you know, don't want that. And so it is difficult. I think it's incredibly, there is that component where it's like, unless we provide the education, unless we ourselves seek out the information, so many people through almost no fault really of their own, this is the life and the environment they live in. And so they keep making those choices without knowing the consequence or that there's better choices. And it's like, until somebody says, hey, by the way, did you know you have a different choice? But then they look at the price tag, right? <laughs> like, oh my gosh, it's $267 for your scarf? Why, yes. <laughs> no, yeah. you know, you, you've lost it. And it's like, well, no, this is on sale. <laughs> Whatever. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that's where the education part comes into play. I think, um, you know, with, again, thinking about other countries doing things, I know Angor rabbits in the States have a bad rap because of what the way the angora is taken in China or other countries, um, the harm that they do to the rabbits. Right. And I get asked that question all the time. I can still remember, I used to take my kids to farmer's markets with me when they were little um, and they would help me. And I can still remember a lady coming up to me and she leaned over and she whispered, how do you kill the rabbits in front of your children to get the fur? And I'm like, no, 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 you know, I mean, that's where people's brains go. They see it on TV. Um, and that's where I struggle. I have a love hate with social media. Um, you know, there, there are days when I just want to wipe my phone and move on, but I have this passion and the only way I can especially right now with where we are in the world, the only way this passion is going to work for me is if I'm on social media. So right. there's always that balance of the crazy. Um, <laughs> but again, educating people and, and getting it out there is, is the way to do it for sure. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely, um, I think definitely something that there's many of us who do spin, who we're very much aware, you know, and yes. Um, it goes back to that passion for it. You, you want others to be aware too, I think, and then educating them. So yeah, absolutely. Good job. <laughs> oh my gosh. Our house is very open because we moved to a church. So, yes. so I'm like upstairs, what would have been the choir loft, but it's still like open to the bottom, which goes literally straight to the kitchen. The kitchen's in like, what would have been the, the altar basically, or the front of the church. So there's not much, uh, there's not much hiding in this house or yep. 
and how fun for the kids. So <laughs> <laughs> It is. But anyways, we've been talking for about an hour. Is there anything else that, anything else that you want to say or ask or? No, I think we hit a lot of what's always rolling through the brain. So yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Well, it was really good to talk with you. I was very excited. I'm still excited. I just want to talk more because it's like, there's so many other, do you have any jewelry to show? Do you have any with you? Um, I do. If you want me to grab it really yes. quick, I'll be right back. That would be awesome. Okay, so this is one of my bracelets. Um, and then I haven't gotten into earrings yet this morning, but this is one of the, uh, the earrings that I did. Um, I started doing the jewelry when it came down to that time thing of balancing out everything I was doing and wanted to continue to create. Um, and of course, Angora's warm. It's seven times warmer than wool. And so you don't want a sweater. You're not going to wear an Angora hat or beanie in the summer, even here in Michigan. Well, maybe some days, but most of the time not. Um, and so my brain started you know, rolling, what else can I do with all this yarn I have? And you started seeing the leather earrings, you know, the leather um, shaped earrings. And I'm like, well, I can do that. And that's where the earrings started coming from. So I have a few different shapes I've done. And then the leather bracelets started coming out, the cuffs. And just as I, I go through Pinterest every now and then and just roll through um, jewelry. And just to see, you know, what's out there and what can I do with my yarn that would, that would work for that. So that's how I came up with the idea for the jewelry. So, yeah. Awesome. Oh boy. Everyone, well, why don't we end there? Cause everyone's starting to run around. And we <laughs> Sounds perfect. So, all right, cool. Well, thank you so much for talking. And then if well, I thank you for having me. Yes, you're welcome. And we'll chat soon. All right. Okay, absolutely. Bye. Bye.